Hey, morning, SEC. A uh, little bit of a different service this morning as we are uh, joining all of our campuses together and sharing the stream and wanted to get each of the campus pastors involved in some way. Just a little over a year ago, we started our fourth campus out in Chase and I uh, thought we'd bring in Pastor Spencer uh, to let us know a little bit about what God's doing out there so that you can be praying uh, for him, for his family, and for all the people who make up that campus. Um, Spencer and his wife, Rachel, have five boys. Good enough reason right there to start praying for them. Um, and uh, they're doing just a great job of loving the people out there, even though um, this is not what we all envision, not what we all at all what we had in mind as to what the spring of 2020 was going to be like. So, Spencer, let me start by this, by asking you this. Where have you seen God working uh, around you lately? Yeah, um, it's been really neat um, just doing this whole um, COVID situation to kind of step back and, and look at um, where the church is at, how it's come, and, and see where the people are at. And it's been really neat to just see how, how God's been working in the lives of, of the people here in Chase over the last year and a bit. Um, there's a, a story of one lady who came to a barbecue that we had a year and a bit ago and has been coming on and off to church and is recently just really solidified in and um, has been just grabbing hold of Jesus in her life. And that's been really amazing to see those uh, another uh, couple in I church who have had some rocky patches, but just even this time that they get to spend at home together um, has been just a huge blessing to their family. And God's been using that um, just to glorify himself and, and to just inject uh, Jesus into, into their everyday life. And it's been really cool to see that as well. And so just seeing God work in, in all these different situations, seeing him work in our lives and in the people's lives has been really cool and really encouraging. That's so great. I mean, that's what we expect, right? We expect that if Jesus is alive, he's still working all around us. And, uh, but he's not just working there. He's also working inside of us. And I know uh, that you share my conviction that one of the best things about being a pastor is that uh, we get to be aware of not just what God's doing around us, but what God's doing in us. So let me ask you this. How have you changed? How has Jesus changed you uh, since uh, starting uh, the church and planting the church? Yeah, it's been really, uh, really neat. Um, just to kind of reflect on that in the last while, too. Um, and one of the big areas that he has just been challenging me and, and um, convicting me and growing me of is just reliance on this promise that Jesus says that he's going to build his church. Um, and coming out here and planting a new campus in Chase, um, sometimes you put these expectations on yourself as to what that should look like or how the church is going to grow. And just through that time, Jesus keep coming, bringing me back to that that he's going to do it, that it's not going to be on the back of my effort. It's going to be uh, as a result of his grace and his work and his glory. Um, and that's been really neat and exciting. And that's even taken another step in this whole COVID thing that we can't do things like programs or these different things. And, and the relationships are a little bit different now. We can't gather together on Sunday mornings. Um, but that promise is still true that even in light of this, as we're not gathering together, Jesus is still at work and he's still going to build his church. And that promise rings true, even though um, we're not gathering together. And so that's been another thing that's just been driven home to me in this last while. Yeah, there is a certain level of dependency in just believing that he's going to do what he's going to do, regardless of how we're going to do what we're going to do. And uh, with that in mind, I know that our church has been praying for you. Uh, I pray for each of our campus pastors every day, uh, all of our pastors and staff every day. And uh, the great privilege of my life is working alongside all of you. In particular, though, Spencer, how can we be praying um, for you? Um, for the church in Chase over the next few uh, next few weeks or months? Yeah, I think um, for our family is a huge one. Um, as you mentioned before, um, with a big family, five kids, things get busy, especially right now with um, homeschooling everybody as well. And so juggling that along with ministry and life and being home and just so just praying for, for energy and strength and wisdom for myself and Rachel, especially who's 
who's serving on the front lines and who's a huge part of the ministry out here in Chase as well. Um, she does music for us. She helps lead uh, uh, a lot of the women's groups that we have and that kind of thing. And then to keep schooling on top of this, um, sometimes it can drain us. So just be praying, especially for her in this time. Um, and just be praying for for our impact in the community. Um, the first year of being out here, we've really strived to just be a, a light to the community that they would know that we're here, that we would, they would know that we love them and that ultimately Jesus loves them. And um, we still want to do that. We still want to be a beacon. And so just providing opportunities to connect um, with groups in, in uh, the community, to connect with people in the community, and, and to just continue to not lose focus on the mission, not lose focus on, on what we're trying to accomplish out here. All right, let's do that. We're going to pray for Spencer, and we're just going to start our worship service this morning by, by interceding on behalf of him and his family and, uh, and asking God to bless, uh, through Jesus, our worship time together. So let's pray. Don't just watch us pray. Pray with us. Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, as we come before you this morning, we do so uh, with hope, a hope that we acknowledge is a supernatural spirit-led hope, uh, that it comes from you, that it comes from the gospel. We thank you that uh, you have blessed Spencer, you've blessed Rachel, you've blessed their family, and you've blessed uh, the, the, the little church out in Chase uh, with that same kind of hope. And my, my prayer, Lord, our prayer this morning is that the community would see that and would ask them the reason, the reason they have to believe uh, that uh, that you are doing something profound in their midst. I pray, Lord, that you would bring the lost uh, to salvation through the gospel ministry that is taking place there, and that you continue to give Spencer and Rachel what they need in order to pursue the calling that you've placed on their lives. Bless their family, uh, bless the boys, bless their homeschooling efforts, um, and bless them in ways that they, uh, that they couldn't even have imagined. Lord, as we have gathered this morning, across our region to give praise and glory to you through worship and through the word. Uh, we do so believing uh, that you are hearing us and that you are smiling on us. Thank you for blessing our church this morning with your grace. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. This morning's passage is from Romans chapter 8 verse 18 to 25. For I consider all the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with long, eager longing for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groaned inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons and the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. Let's declare the splendor of our King. The splendor of our King. Clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. And darkness tries.
Thanks, Bob, for leading us this morning in worship. As you know, you might know, this is a, a different service for us this Sunday. If you're from Chase or Sorrento uh, or Sycamuse, uh, your campus pastor has been a part of this service, but uh, isn't necessarily leading the service. That's because we wanted to set aside one Sunday a month just to come together, uh, to be united across the region, to offer all of our gifts and our talents, and uh, tell some of the stories that are happening within Shushwap Community Church. I've really come to appreciate uh, Bob and Jordan and Steve and Spencer. Uh, I always did, but over the last couple months, uh, the last six weeks especially, uh, I've really experienced the love of God from each of them, from all of our pastors and many of our staff, uh, demonstrating uh, a, a kindness and a goodness and a reminder of the love of God that, that is a profound power in the world and especially demonstrated through believers to one another. There's been times where each of us have been high and low on different days, and it's in those days that, that we've found that God's love is spoken from one to the other, from those who are high to those who are low. And that's been of great encouragement, and I hope you've received that same encouragement uh, from the pastors and the staff of our, our church. Please be praying for them. Be praying for all of us. As we're navigating uh, this season, here's what we do believe, though, that it's God's love that's going to carry us regardless of what the future holds. 1 Corinthians 13 has this little verse right in the middle of it. It says, love bears all things, love believes all things, love hopes all things, and love endures all things. We know that it's God's love that saves us. We also know that it's God's love that sanctifies us. What I mean by that is it's God's love that causes us to trust him more and more, regardless of what it is we're going through. Christians are uniquely equipped to handle seasons like this pandemic. As we experience God's love that causes us to bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, and endure all things, we find ourselves with a peace, I'm going to say even a patience, that may be uncommon to the rest of the world. God's love is this power that's at work in our lives that, that reminds us of some critical doctrines that then gives us the... the uh, the trust and the faith to enter into our lives, enter into the world without fear of being destabilized, without fear of becoming insecure. It's God's love that produces patience. Patience is found in some of our doctrines. We believe that we aren't and don't belong to this world, that we're citizens of another world that we're part of a kingdom and, and, and serve a king who is transcendent, who is eternal, and one day will return in full glory, Jesus. Until that day, we wait patiently for his return, deepening our trust and our love for God. But that word patience is often, often received negatively. I don't know about you, but I know when someone says to me, be patient, I feel like I'm being treated like a child. And then even in the passage that we're going to look at today that Pastor Steve read for us, we see Paul encouraging the people to embrace a hope in what they do not see because it produces patience. And when I hear that, be patient, I do feel like I'm being treated as though a child who needs to be patronized to wait for something that I don't want to wait for. As a grown-up, I, I believe I should have whatever I want whenever I want it. And, and that uh, mentality has been exposed in this time where, where it just seems like the things that we found comfort in and convenience in have been removed from us. We have to wait in longer lines. We can't and don't have the freedom to go where we want when we want We're called, though, as Christians to continue to press in to engage the love of God to produce a trust in us that establishes hope and looks like patience. 
With that in mind, I'd like to take you to Romans chapter 8, the passage that, that uh, we've read already today, and, and to find in Paul's words an encouragement in this direction. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but, but just highlight a few things that, that, that are happening in our world, that are happening in creation, and therefore are happening in our own hearts and our lives. Romans 8 stands as this wonderful, uh, sparkling jewel that is the wisdom of Scripture. The book of Romans is a profound theological treatise. But at the height of it, at the climax, which is Romans 8, Paul brings it all and makes it incredibly relevant to the Christian. A theology that is not about what we know and what we agree with, but about what we experience and how we live, waiting for our theology and this gospel reality to finally come to fruition. He starts this paragraph right in the middle of Romans 8, verse 18. He says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is about to be revealed to us. Oftentimes, I read scripture from a cynic's point of view, from a skeptic's point of view, from a view that that it's going to patronize me. And if I look at it through that lens, I miss this word, which is, which is an encouragement to, to find the good in suffering, to not give in to despair. I would find it to be a little bit patronizing, except for this. When Paul says, I have considered this, he's saying that he's thought long and hard about the trials of this life, about what his faith has cost him, and whether or not it's worth it. He was a man who was familiar with trial, just like Jesus. He was someone who who understood grief, who understood the cost of being a, a God follower. He found himself persecuted. He found himself uh, uh, under certain tragedies. He found himself in prison and he found himself shipwrecked. And while he was in those times, those times where the suffering that he was experiencing had brought him to this place of, of, of not being able to move as freely as he would want to, he would consider, he would think to himself, is this worth it? And his conclusion is yes. That the sufferings that I'm experiencing now, he's saying, are, are not even worth comparing to what I would receive. That it is totally worth it. What's, what's not worth comparing to? What's the word he uses? The glory. Glory is this word we see throughout scripture and it's a mysterious word. God is described as being glorious. For a simple definition, we can just say that the glory of something is seen when we see it for how it truly is. Maybe a good example is what we're seeing even now around the world, that as people have stopped moving about, as people have stopped driving about, city skylines have been made clear. And you can see the glory of cities and of nature because there isn't as much smog in the air. There's a clarity, there's a brilliance that, 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 that people are starting to see because there isn't this movement that's taking place. You see, the glory is being shone where it once could not be shone before. We're seeing things in greater measure in, in cities like Jakarta or New Delhi or even Los Angeles. Glory is seeing things with illumination and therefore clarity. And Paul is saying that the suffering that we go through compared to the glory that will be revealed to us is totally worth it. He goes so far as to say that that this is what creation is longing for. Says that creation is waiting eagerly, longing for this revealing of glory. In what way? The revealing of the sons of God. The language kind of points us to this idea that that creation is on its tiptoes with an incredible anticipation and excitement about what is about to come. Like a small child in an ice cream shop, in tap and co-op, if you will, reaching up to the edge of that freezer and just looking in, gazing and waiting for the wonder that is ice cream. Creation is eagerly waiting for the revealing of the glory of God. How? That it'll be through the revealing of the sons of God. Paul says that the clarity and the glory is going to be seen when believers are exposed and therefore imaged to God, his glory. 
God will reveal in glory those who the sons of our God are, who the sons of God are, and the daughters of God are, and the recreation of all things will be complete. This is what creation is waiting for. Why are they waiting? Because the creation was subject to futility, and they weren't doing so willingly. Creation knows something that humanity seems to struggle to grasp or agree with. Whereas humans in their sinfulness, as we introduced the curse into the world, it was a curse that, that affected not just us, but everything. And the rest of creation has been diminished from its glory. This futility extends into all areas of life. And it's something that, that we're coming to realize, that, that we're living within the futility that this pandemic has exposed. For some, it's a physical futility. They've faced an... Uh, a foreign sickness, a new disease. For some, for some the, ex- the futility has extended into their mental health or relational dysfunction or even spiritual isolation. We're beginning to experience in, in a real way what creation has been experiencing since the fall, and that is, that is futility. And they're longing they're longing for that day when, when the sons of God will be revealed because it'll be on that day that creation will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Oh, there's some powerful, powerful, wonderful, and yet mysterious truth right in that little verse. The creation will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. When glory comes to earth, when, when we see it in, in Jesus upon his return, uh, the first place that it's going to take a hold of is in humanity, and particularly those who are children of God that they will be the first ones to be set free from the bondage of decay, that they will be the first ones to be liberated from the curse and from the fall. They will be the first ones to be glorified, and then creation, all of creation, will follow. Now, I just want to take just a a minute and talk about this mystery of glory. It's not perfection. Man and all creation was made perfect. And we read about that in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And and we know that it was perfect because, A, God said so, and B, there was no shame that that magnifies imperfection. But what the Scripture is telling us, what Paul is telling us, is that perfection is not the pinnacle of creation. Glory is the pinnacle. There's mystery to that. I get that. The glory is more than perfection. Perfection. But many of us, many of us are on this, this, this life path just, just driving forward to grant, grab perfection and calling it glory, and it's not. Here's how we know this. You see, Jesus, the first time, came in perfection, but the next time, he will come in glory. And so those of us who are sons and daughters of God, who are the children of God, we don't live our lives or look forward to perfection. We look forward to victory. We look forward to glory. We look forward to things not even being like they were at creation. We look forward to them being uh, just magnified in glory. Therefore, we are freed from the demands of perfection even now. And the demands of glory, as though it's something that we're waiting for, we do not need to find it through all of our achievements, through the the demands that our world, that our lives, that our actions be perfect. Therefore, we don't have to live according to an impossible standard of life, and we don't have to demand perfection of our homes, of our families who simply cannot live up to that. We don't have to demand perfection even from our leaders who will inevitably make mistakes, which I'm sure we'll constantly remind them of. The glory of God will not be something that we imagine, but it will envelop our whole being. The freedom of the glory of the children of God. This is what creation is waiting for. This is the vision of all of creation. You can take some time to imagine that. 
Creation, the scripture says, declares the glory of God, which means that, that we can taste it, that we can be familiar with it, but we cannot define it. It comes not through the imagination, but through cultivating a deep trust in God. Creation, the cosmos, understands this, that as they wait for creation and and wait for glory, and as they declare it to what degree that they can, they, they wait for it, trusting that God is going to bring it. You see, a hunger for glory and the hope and the patience that comes from that is the fruit of a deep trust in God. How do we get that trust? Well, strangely enough, this passage says we get it by groaning of all things. So creation declares the glory of God. The Psalms tell us that. And Paul tells us here, they're also groaning, that they they are waiting and growing together in the pains of childbirth. Creation is longing, that that it's almost as though they're on their tiptoes and reaching for something. And the sound that comes out of their mouth is that groan. It's just not quite in my grasp yet. Paul uses the metaphor of childbirth. That there's a pain, that there's a a suffering that, that is is inevitable before the birth, the glory of new life. Maybe you've experienced that even over the last few weeks. Maybe you've experienced this strange pandemic fatigue, this kind of uh, of groaning and this longing and the sighs that come along with that. And there's sounds coming out of you that you're not familiar with. You're just joining in creation. You're just a part of the choir that is the whole cosmos longing, longing for things to be changed, to be renewed, to be recreated. You're longing and groaning for the glory of God. Now, we, we we would rather not groan. Instead, I think we'd rather grumble, right? Now, groaning, as described here, is not the grumbling that we often find ourselves doing. And, and I think it's important to say this. See, grumbling is a complaint that is attached to imperfection. It's, it's an easy blame that comes when we are inconvenienced. So let me ask you this. During the pandemic, have you been groaning or have you been grumbling? Sometimes we grumble when we've romanticized the past where we just want things to be the way they were. I just wish things were like they were in February, like they were in January, like they were in 2015, in 2020. I just wish the things were like they were when I was a kid. That's not groaning, that's grumbling. We've romanticized the past. We've, we've held it up to a, in a higher regard, said there was more glory then there, there is now. And maybe you've uttered these words, this whole thing is stupid. And all you want, to the point of even demanding it, is that things get back to normal and they do so quickly. That grumbling, that grumbling is the sound not of patience but of impatience. Sometimes we avoid groaning by simply adapting. We just say, I'm going to find a new normal. I'm going to make this my coping mechanism. And so during the pandemic, you haven't said, this is stupid. You're saying, this is really not that big a deal. And adapting is necessary. It's, it's really important that we figure out how to live in a changing world, how we do so, even as Christians, without sacrificing or compromising our values. But adapting is Not how we trust God, it's how we trust ourselves. When we choose to adapt to a new normal, what we're saying is, is I can find salvation in my self-reliance. I can find glory in my salvation, in that salvation by my self-reliance. Paul is saying here that the groaning that all creation is going through is not the sound of grumbling, it's the sound of worship. Groaning in creation sounds like a lament. It's a very, very fancy word. It's an old-fashioned word. It's a biblical word. There's a whole book of the Bible that is all about lament. And what is lament? Lament is the groans that come from living, 
Living in an incomplete world, groaning is the feeling of unfamiliarity with our limitations. Groaning is when we experience the inevitability of our own mortality. Groaning is a sense of incompleteness. Groaning is this longing. Groaning is this faith that's often called and synonymous with lament. Lament requires, one author said, that one stand in the presence of God as sovereign and holy Lord, implying accountability, openness to the other, awareness of sin, of personal shortcoming, of attribution of the whole cosmos to the creator. Lament, this groaning that that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8, is worship. Because as we are unfamiliar with our limitations, we see that God is good and wants us to experience his sufficiency. That when we are experiencing the inevitability of our own mortality, we realize that God is great and wants us to experience his sovereignty. That as we lament this sense of incompleteness that that is expressed in our hopeful waiting, we recognize by opening up ourselves to God, by doing this lament and groaning in worship, that God is gracious, that he is close and that he is near, and that he wants us to experience his mercy that this longing, this lament really is faith because it's bringing, it's bringing our fallibility to him and receiving from him his infallibility and the hope that comes from that. Oftentimes we mistake and lament for the absence of hope, but really lament is the manifestation of hope because it requires that we stand in the presence of God in all of his holiness, believing that he is gracious that we acknowledge our accountability to him and allow him to see us in our limited, imperfected, and unglorified state, but in so doing, we experience the freedom of honesty. It requires, it requires that we attribute the whole cosmos to the creator, that we find ourselves living within this broken world and identifying with a broken world, that we might feel the sovereignty of God. And it's then we know that he hears our prayer. Psalm 102, verse 17 says this, he regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. And God is not looking for your perfect offerings. God is not saying, show me your glory. What God is saying is, I will give you mine when you get my grace in my nearness, in my closeness, as you experience your limitations, as you experience your uh, fallibility, as you experience the inevitability of mortality. I draw near to you and you hear of my glory. How? In the gospel. Calvin said this about Psalm 102. He says, When the faithful are scattered and are without their regular assemblies, the Lord will hear their groaning in this desolate dispersion. What's our hope in this time? Our hope is knowing that Psalm 102 is true, that God hears our groans. He hears our pleas. He hears the pleas of creation. And when he hears it, he intends to do something about that. That's the pattern we see throughout all of Scripture. When God hears the groans of his beloved creation, he intends to do something to bring about resolution. Our groaning is therefore centered on hope, on on what God will do in bringing about renewal, but also in what God has already done. See, we ourselves, we groan inwardly, but we do so, as the passage says, having the first fruits of the Spirit. Having the first fruits of the Spirit, what is that? Well, the first action of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to produce faith in Christ. That as much as we long for everything to be made new, this renewal to come, we actually know that it is guaranteed because of what God has already done in Christ. That's where we place our faith. We don't see it yet, but it's true now. That's where we place our hope, and it's in this hope that we are saved. 
That as we groan, as we groan in worship, in lament, joining in all creation with that longing and that expectation that God will do something, but also with that honesty that comes from knowing our fallibility, from knowing our mortality and being aware of our limitations, we find, we find that God has already started this work and did so in Christ. And in that hope, we're saved. We place our hope in that and that alone that Jesus shows us that God loves us. That it was his sacrifice that allows us to have this hope for his glory to come. It's his sacrifice that allows us to experience now his love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. See, Christ bore the brokenness of humanity to show us the perfect love of God. And Christ believed in the love of God to save us in love. And Christ hoped for glory that was revealed in his resurrection and that Christ endured all things, including the pain and suffering of Calvary so that we could know hope in the midst of despair, peace in the midst of chaos, joy in the midst of suffering, and an unconditional love that will never, ever reject us. In this hope, we are saved qualifies it a little bit he says now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees see that's the necessity of faith faith in what God has already done placing our faith in that produces a hope for it what he will do we place our hope that one day we will see Christ clothed in glory but we place our faith in seeing that Christ is now clothed in the gospel. Hope, Christ revealed in glory. Now faith, believing that Christ is clothed in the gospel, that he's clothed in righteousness as the perfect son of God, that he's clothed in this humanity and and he knows and understands our groaning, that he's clothed in mercy, that he draws near to us, that he's clothed in love as demonstrated on the cross. Do you see him? One day, yeah, and we long for that day with a hope that cannot be taken away from us, a hope that shows that we are truly saved, that we are truly children of God, that we're truly the ones who will experience his glory touching every part of our lives first. We long for and we look for that day when Christ will appear clothed in glory. Until that day, we place our faith in the truth that Christ right now is clothed in the gospel. If we hope for what we do not see, we will wait for this with patience. Our faith rests in who Christ was when he came the first time. Our hope rests in how he will come the next time. I read this, I wanna share it with you and we'll clothe that we know Christ as he was and we love Christ for how he will reveal himself to be. First time he came as a lamb, the next time he will come as a lion. First time to redeem, next time to reign. First time to die, next time to raise the dead. First time crown of thorns, next time crown of glory. First time in poverty, next time in power. First time in meekness, next time in majesty. Now Christ clothed in the reality of the gospel for each one of us and we experience by faith a hope in the not yet that Christ will come appearing in all and full glory, making everything new again. That's where we find patience in these times. For our church, we wanna unite ourselves in faith and in hope and express that to one another and to the world in love that will show a peace that that is unfamiliar to people who don't know Christ. It will require us continuing to remind one another of hope so that each of us will have our faith strengthened. It will look like and feel like patience. This is the gift of God. This is the fruit of the gospel. We're praying for you. Each of your pastors is praying for you each and every day, and we know you're praying for us. 
And I'd like to do that for you right now. And particularly for those who have yet to place their faith in Jesus and experience the hope that saves. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come before you acknowledging our need for the love of God. Our fallibility, our mortality, and our limitations have all been exposed. And for some of us, it's been surprising. Oh, that you would visit on us the love that comes from knowing you, Lord Jesus, a love that bears all things and believes all things and hopes all things and endures all things. And Lord, that you would give by your Holy Spirit faith for people to see you as the Lamb, the redemption, that they would see in your death a sacrifice, that they would see in your grace, a love that is victorious. We long and groan for the glory of God to be revealed through the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. Until that day, Lord Jesus, would you strengthen our faith and would you cause us to worship whether they be songs of joy or whether they be words of lament, might we see that it is all grace to be able to bring you our praise and to bring you our groaning, knowing that you hear it and that you have done something about it in your name and for your glory, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us this morning, all four SCC campuses. It has been fun to collaborate with uh, Chase and Sycamus and Serrano and Sam and Arm, and we're just thankful you joined us this morning. I uh, hope you've been encouraged, maybe challenged. If there's something you're going through or something that you just heard this morning and you'd like prayer for any reason at all, uh, please feel free to email us at scc at a place to belong .ca, uh, or reach out to any of our pastors or staff. And we want to be sure to pray for you, pray with you. Uh, in the same way we end every service as we gather, that you know you're prayed for, cared for. And so please feel free to take that opportunity. Let me leave you with this benediction out of Romans 5, and it is so appropriate for what we just heard preached well. Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Amen? Let's go into this week with that grace in mind, and I hope you have a good rest of your morning. <laughs>